Did you ever think you would make it? I feel I'm supposed like to take sweet victory. I know this life meant for me. Yeah, why would you bet on Goliath when we got bet David? Value payment, giving values contagious. This world of entrepreneurs, we get no value to hate it. they run, homie, look what I become. I'm the, I'm the one. Parents, this is a podcast you're going to want to listen to from beginning to the end. As a parent of four, myself and Tom, two girls. I got two boys, two girls. Uh, it's an issue that bothers me. I don't like it. I'm in a position where I can make some noise and make some push uh, uh, my weight around, but sometimes people don't. This is more about a, a podcast we're doing for parents that sometimes feel helpless, but we want to give you resources to not feel helpless and hear different stories and have your kids uh, who are possibly being manipulated or brainwashed into thinking some way to see stories of others who went through it and what they did about it and how they're going through uh, uh, you know, their own set of challenges. So today's guests... Um, Today's guest, we have three folks here with us. One, we have Ollie London, who flew out from London, uh, is a British YouTuber who publicly identified as a non-binary and began transitioning from male to female in 2018 before reverting back to male in 2022. He's got a book com- uh, that just came out as well called Gender Madness. You can order that. Ollie's here with us. Thank you, Ollie, for being with us. Thanks, a pleasure. And then we have Luca Hine, who is a detransitioner who underwent a double mastectomy at age 16, at 21, Luca sued her doctors for the rushed procedure, becoming the fifth person in U.S. to pursue legal action for hasty gender-affirming treatment. Thank you so much for being on. Of course. And then last but not least, Aaron Friday, who is an American lawyer and activist, who is the parent of a formerly gender-confused child, Aaron Advocates, fighting for children, adults, and detransitioners, struggling with gender identity, and gender expression. Aaron, thank you for being on. Thank you for having me. Of course. And uh, gang, while we're going through this, I just want you to kind of pay attention to this data. You know, Tell me if this concerns you at all, because it does to me. Uh, in 2019, the, in the U.S., the hormone replacement therapy market size was, ready, $10.2 billion. And that's in 2019. We don't know what it is in 2024, uh, what it'll be, what it'll be in 2023. It's telling us it grows at a uh, rate of 6.1%. And the male-to-female gender reassignment surgery segment alone was valued at $185 million in 2019. There's a lot of money involved in this. There's a lot of things being speculated on why this is taking place. This is the U.S. sex reassignment surgery market. It's an industry, a full-blown industry. If you're looking at something that will give you a good rate of return, it looks like this could do that for you because the media, many schools are behind it. This is a collective effort of them trying to confuse your kids and it's important for you to be involved so you can help your kids while they're going through this messy phase having said that let's get right into it Aaron would you mind starting off sharing a bit of your background how you got into this space as a lawyer yourself you live in San Francisco San Francisco's already got a lot of crazy things going on targeting you know uh, uh, what Newsom's going through what California's going through what the streets are looking like And on top of that, something like this. So if you don't mind sharing your background with the audience, that'd be great. Sure. So um, I'm a Democrat of 37 years, which is going to shock your audience. (laughs) (laughs) And, um, you know, my daughter came home from seventh grade, she and all of her friends, uh, from sex ed class. And they all decided that they were something on the alphabet. None of them picked a white girl who likes boys um, because that would make them oppressors. And that was the first opening to me of some, that something's going on at our schools. And I was quite shocked because I was a volunteer at the school. So I knew all these teachers by a first uh, name basis. And, you know, fast forward, all of these uh, kids, including my kid, went from you know, pansexual, polyamorous, non-binary, and then lesbian, and then landed on trans, and trans seems to stick. And that's how um, I got involved, and I decided that once I got my daughter stable, that it was my duty to save other kids and to make sure that no other parent went through what we went through. Ollie, how about yourself? Um, So I struggled with identity for a number of years since my teenage years. I used to get bullied a lot and I had a very bad relationship with my father. So I kind of became very feminine and I was always told, you know, you're more like a girl. You're, you know, 
I was never treated as a boy. I was never sporty. So um, as I became an adult, I started undergoing surgeries and I kind of became addicted to that because it was the feeling of validation and feeling better about yourself every time you do something. And, you know, I ended up having 32 surgeries in total. I had 11 facial feminization surgeries in one day. And, you know, it would give me a temporary fix, just like most people that are transitioning or changing these days. You feel great for a couple of months because you get that validation, mm -hmm. you get positive reinforcements. And then I got to that point where I was like, where am I going with this? I'm getting more and more unhappy. It's making my relationship with my mother very bad. It's it's It was a, such a tough situation. And then I actually started going to church because I needed an outlet to try and uh, you know, find myself and get some peace of mind. And, you know, since then, I've been, you know, waking up to what's going on and trying to be an advocate for all these kids. Uh, very interesting story. How about yourself? Um, so I was someone who was going going through a lot as a young teenager. That, that might be an understatement of everything going on. But um, and kind of found that, like, the trans identity seemed to be like a fix for all my problems, essentially. It was presented to me as oh, you're not uncomfortable because of X, Y, or Z happening in your life. You're not dealing with trauma. Uh, you don't hit your period because you're just, you know, like a teenage girl. Uh, you are a boy that's just born in the wrong body. And that ended with me, the very first uh, medical intervention I ever had being a double mastectomy at 16. Then a few months later, I was put on hormones. And then at 20, I detransitioned. Can you give me the speed of, you know, I'm having these thoughts and this is what I want to do, mom, dad, can I see the doctor? This is where you're at, I think, after like 52 minutes or whatever. They said, here's what okay. And then here's the first surgery. What was that timeline like? So my freshman year of high school, I actually came out as transgender in a what is called a partial hospitalization program, which is like a step down from inpatient. So it is essentially an intensive therapy program. I came out as transgender there, and then my parents were told, okay, well, we're going to we need to tell you about this because there's a perceived suicide risk there. Uh, so you need to know. And then from there, I went to a gender affirming therapist, as in a specific therapist who specializes in, uh, quote unquote, gender diverse young people. Um, and of course, you know, the minute the minute I walked in there, it was affirmation only. We are there's no really working through this. It's just you you're what's the next step in transition, essentially. And I saw her for about a year, because um, I would have been, let's see, 15, yeah, 15 at the time. And then when I, so the summer when I was 16, that is when I had surgery. The summer when you were 16 is when you had surgery. Mm -hmm. for, so, so from the moment you saw the doctor, how much longer after the surgery happened? Um, so the surgeon... The surgeon that we saw who was kind of associated with the gender clinic, because my therapist was actually like she worked with the gender clinic itself. So it. she was not a neutral party by any means. Got it. Um, and so essentially why they went to chest surgery first is I was like, okay, well, I'm really uncomfortable with my chest. And so they were like, okay, this can fix this. We'll, we'll tackle the biggest issue first. Um, and so I saw the surgeon briefly once in March of that year. And that was initially because I was going to have surgery over my high school spring mm -hmm. break. And mm -hmm. then we were like, okay, that that's not enough time to recover and go back to like carrying a backpack around. And so that got moved to the summer. But essentially before surgery, I only saw the surgeon like twice. Um, I believe there was some sort of like phone consultation with my parents. But um, aside from that, it was just like, the initial consultation and then the appointment before surgery. What was the language right like? Like what what I want to know is uh, if I'm a parent and I got a say I got an eight year old girl, I'm like okay, I got to be prepared for this. I can't afford to put my kids into a private school. I'm going to public school, and maybe I'm in California. I never want to leave. I'm in New York. I'm in Illinois. I'm in one of these weird mm -hmm. states. And what is the structure did they put fear in mom and dad if you don't do this she could commit suicide was it more we're going to help you this is what we're going to do there's solutions for this you know you are categorically falling into what language did you see them use so it is a it is very much a mix of both uh you hear you hear lines thrown around a lot like would you rather have a dead daughter or a living son would doctors you saying this uh, yeah, d medical professionals will say this. You have, would you rather have a dead daughter or a living son? Uh, would you rather be planning a transition or a funeral? Um, and they will tell this to wow, parents wow. who are desperate. Seriously, They are desperate. And then to the kids, of course, it is one, 
you're instill already instilling that fear of suicide because we know suicide has a social contagion factor. And when you tell vulnerable young people mm. that like, if you, you know, this is your only way out. And if you don't get that, the, your other option is essentially suicide. It lives in your head. I was never a suicide risk um, before I transitioned. And throughout my transi transition, I wasn't really a suicide risk either. Um, except even then I still had that thought in the back of my head of like, okay, well I had surgery and I'm, I'm not suicidal now, but like if I, if I don't go on to the next step of transition, will I be? And so it is a driving factor and it comes from a place of fear. And then you have the other half of it, which is essentially the love bombing and affirmation from the community and these same medical professionals, huh, I can um, see that. telling you, okay, well now you found, you found your true self. You are, you know, this is who you're always meant to be. Um, and essentially just going through and being like, you're valid, you are loved, your parents don't understand you, but we do, and we're here to listen, and we're here to help you, um, all while driving that wedge in between a parent and a child when, when a child is going something through like, going through something like this, they need their parents close, and they need to be building that relationship, and a great sign that this is not a like necessarily kind and is almost a predatory action is the fact that if it was really, you know, such a suicide risk, if it was really such a present thing, you would want these parents involved as much as possible and you would be building that relationship of love instead of breaking down that trust. It, did, did TikTok have anything to do with it or no? Because you're, you're, you're born in 2002, mm -hmm. so you're, you're 21. <laughs> Right, so TikTok mm -hmm. is still a thing in your life at the time if you're 16. I don't know if TikTok I, was. I, I believe it was called Musically at right. the time. Musically, yes. <laughs> um, I was never on that. Uh, I watched a lot of YouTube. Okay. Um, YouTube and Instagram. I was never. People like to point to Tumblr. I was never on Tumblr. Um, really, really, just that, and also just like finding out about this stuff because I, I will say I found out about a lot of this stuff because it came into prominence. Kind of um, right when, right after gay marriage was legalized, um, and then all of a sudden the tone shifted, and all these other words were coming up. And so, of course, you know, I was in like junior high when gay marriage was legalized, and it was, you know, that was kind of a lot of uh, people my age is first, especially if you lived a little bit more sheltered or you're like in a little bit smaller school. That was like the first introduction to the LGBT community. And of course, it was you know presented as like oh well, love is love, all all this all this stuff you know, um, and then after that was legalized, there was a like firm tone shift from you know gay adults doing what they want and getting married like that all of a sudden to the trans stuff. There's right to the trans stuff, um, and the, the the theory about that is that all these all these like activist organizations once gay marriage was legalized, they didn't have anything else to fight for, so they shifted mm. to the trans stuff. Um, and that is where you start hearing terms terms like non-binary, uh, transgender, and those were being more heavily introduced into the mainstream for people my age on Makes sense. all sorts of social media. I want to, Aaron. I want to come to you because, uh, and thank you for that. Mm -hmm. But I want to come to you because for you, you know, you're listening to this, and I watch the way when you do interviews. You're 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 a lawyer, so naturally you're watching to find leaks in the opposition's argument, and you're trying to see what their approach is, what their tactic is, what they're doing. You've gone through this from the parent's perspective, okay? She's gone through this as the child perspective. And Ollie's gone through it in a complete different perspective, right? For you, from the parent's perspective. When, what caused you to all of a sudden get a little bit more concerned and involved? Well, as soon as my daughter came out as trans, that was the ultimate concern. And also overhearing the school calling her by a different name and a different pronoun without involving the parent. I mean, that was red flag, red flag. Um, and, and I, you know, I understand what Luca's parents went through because I went through it. We went to different psychologists, different psychiatrists, different doctors. Every single one of them told me to affirm my child. I even had a psychiatrist tell me that my memory of my daughter being this girly girl from age, you know, baby to the age of 13 was a false memory. It was so absurd to me. Um, I was given the uh, suicide stats to 41%. And then I would, I would query these you know, medical providers, so-called experts, and I'd say, well, tell me a little bit more about the study. How many people were in that study? What questions were asked? Not one of them can answer the question because no one had read the study. Well, I had. I had re read the study, and I found them all to be flimsy as all get out. Um, but... 
yeah, I mean, the, the pressure on the parents, I was also told my daughter would commit suicide. Um, my daughter actually told me that she would commit suicide because all trans kids commit suicide. So the fear of the parent is, is real, and you, f- you have no one to turn to to help you. You do this alone. So I understand when parents capitulate because it's really a tough journey as a parent because everyone hates you. The teachers hate you. I had Child Protective Services come to my house for not affirming my child. I had the police come to my house. I have lost. What are you, what are you talking about? You're the police and Child Protective Services come to your house in California. What are they telling you when they come to your house? So this is how it went down. So um, after, you know, this is COVID. So my daughter's down the hallway from me. And I hear them calling her a male name and using male pronouns. So I call the school. And I read them the riot act. I mean, I lay into them hard um, about they have no right to change my my daughter's name. Uh, And they said, well, we need to be a safe space. Safe space? She's down the hall from me. She never stepped foot into that school. It's COVID. This is, you know, freshman year of high school. I asked them, tell me one thing about my daughter. Is she tall? Is she fat? What color is her hair? They knew nothing about her. Wow. Nothing about her. <laughs> Let me, while you're going through this, like I'm trying to think, uh, you and your husband, are you guys married at the time? Are you guys together at the time? Are you on the same page of what you are not for and what you are for politically as well as with what to do with your kids? We are totally on the same page. At the time? Yes. So you've always been on the same page? Correct. Got it. So it's not like a... You know, because sometimes uh, these types of things, like you heard about Dwayne Wade and his wife, right? Where Dwayne Wade, Miami, local, he moves to California because he feels safer for his kid transitioning. But the mom's like, what are you doing? Let's wait till 18 years old. So sometimes in these types of situations, mom and dad are not on the same page. So there's a leak to come in between, kind of similar maybe for, you know, Ollie didn't have the best relation with his father. That could be also a trend that you notice. But that wasn't the case with you guys. No, I was very lucky. So as a person living in San Fran, you're seeing that taking place. They're targeting your kids. What, what moves are you making? Are you playing offense? Are you sitting there saying, you know, this is number one priority. I'm going to find out everything about this because you're not in a state that is on your side. They don't, they don't protect you. You're in a state that they protect their political, you know, policies and whatever they want to do. They're not going to favor a mother or a parent telling their kids, who they should be. Well, that's the fun part because early on I played defense. You can't win a game playing defense. So we went on the offensive in California and I wrote a, I wrote six bills um, and I shot them around and one Republican lawmaker, um, assemblyman, Bill Asaley, picked it up. And uh, we went on the offensive and it's been really quite you know, amazing to see that California is making this change. So we have... Um, parental notification policies that are being passed in, mm. in in schools now, and that's all because we decided to go on the offensive, and that's what we're doing, and we're going to continue to do that. Um, that's why we're doing the initiative. Is we can't play defense, and they should be actually afraid of us because parents we're powerful. If we all join forces, we are powerful, and we can stop this. Even in the most liberal state in the union, we can stop this. Are you noticing you you uh, 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 unifying with other parents, mothers who are Republicans, because you're not one, you're a Democrat, and you're sitting there saying, well, we have something in common here, you know, our kids, we're going to fight for our kids, you know, is it bringing, you know, because offline you and I were talking and you said, you know, every parent wants this for their kids. And I said, for me, I don't understand why some parents are caving in. And they're like, it's almost as if it's politics before their kids. And you said, I don't think that's the case. You said it's something else, if you want to unpack that for the audience. Because to some of us, we're sitting there saying, well, that's, you know, liberal policies. It's being liberal. If your kid wants to do that, let them. If they want to do this, let them. But you're saying that's not the case. It's not the case. And the media is not presenting it. So even getting my name in the media is almost impossible because I'm a Democrat. They don't want to put my name out there. They don't want anyone to find me that you know, a liberal Democrat is actually against this. And, you know, I run a parent group. About 80% of us are Democrats or were Democrats. We're all voting Republican in 2024, just so you know. But <laughs> but we were Democrats. 
and, and we're against this, but the media doesn't ever spotlight this fact. We are hidden. We are the best kept secret. So yes, the Democrats are standing with the Republicans. Look, m my reach is I've got the radical feminists all the way on the, on the left are fighting this. And then I've got the evangelicals on the right. And we are all joining hands. And so the Democrats should actually be really scared because we are going on the offensive and we are putting our differences aside to safeguard kids. And shocking, we actually have more in common than I ever thought. You know, hanging out with um, Republican groups, I'm like, actually, we agree on about 80% of the same things. They siloed us. They wanted us to think each other are monsters. We're not. We actually have so much in common, and we have to use that, you know, to stop this. Can I ask you a question? You, you, you mentioned about Gavin Newsom. And about four weeks ago, um, and I read it, and I read a lot of um, uh, in, the, in the media, that it was Gavin trying to walk to the center to getting pr pr ready for a presidential run. But he backed off a bill, a trans and parent notification bill. Were you involved in that? Were you lobbying on that? Can you unpack that? Because the narrative people heard Rob, that I read up that bill that I read was, oh, Gavin's running to the center. He wants to look like he's in the center. And he also, you know, vetoed other bills about having, you know, um, self-driving trucks were OK. And it's all about a centricist. But it sounds like your fingerprints were all over what he did. Can you unpack it? Yeah, you're correct. Um, we were fighting AB 957, which is a bill that would have forced uh, judges to uh, find that the health, safety, and welfare of a child, it's their best interest to support their transgender identity. Against the parents. Against the parents. Got it. And, and the yep. reason, I mean, let's be clear. I'm really happy that, that Newsom vetoed that, and it was a huge win because this is what they were trying to do, and most people miss this. They looked at the bill and said, this is just in divorce. So in divorce, they're going to favor the parent who affirms the child. But when you tie those three words, health, safety, and welfare to supporting a trans identity, now you just made it child abuse. So parents like me could have had my child taken because I wouldn't transition my child. So it was bigger than that. It's actually um, you know, the opposite of Texas. It would have been p penalizing parents who would not transition their kids. What Gavin Newsom knows and what I know is that when there is a divorce situation and there's one parent supporting the transgender identity and one that's not, the parent who is supporting the trans identity always gets the kid in California. That's already happening. This bill was going to add to it to make it, you know, child abuse. So if you're disingenuous, that's your custody hack. Exactly. Exactly. So he was... You know, they were trying to go through the back door. I know Scott Weiner. Scott Weiner was the author of this bill. I watch this guy. I study this guy. Um, I know what they're doing. I, I read everything in California. But let me just talk about one bill that Gavin Newsom did approve because it's, a, it's the scariest bill I've ever seen. Mm. It's AB 665. What this bill does is it's state-sanctioned kidnapping. 12-year-olds, if you're 12 or older, these kids can run away to a state run uh, facility, residential facility with no claim of abuse on their, on their parents. For no reason, for any reason, they can run away and they can get housed away from their parents. you call parents. that state-sanctioned kidnapping? Yes, because the state is allowing a 12-year-old for any reason to take off from their family yeah. and go live in a residential facility. Did this approve? Yes. So Gavin Newsom signed that into law. That is a terribly frightening bill. So in the world of trans, it goes something like this. You've got a seventh grader who goes into their school counselor and says, I'm trans and my parents won't support it. Okay, what, would you like to stay in a residential facility? Would you like to stay away from your bigoted, hateful family? We'll send you to this facility. And off the kid goes. And you said, they're, they're, let me interrupt you, for people listening, you, between the lines there, you said, and there does not have to be any record of abuse or something that the child has reported or maybe got a family member to help report a parent. Zero on record, they can walk in and do this. Zero, zero. So this wow. is the blowing up of the family, and this is taking the child when the child is 12 years old, and we know what's ha what happens when they go to these residential facilities. What can parents do to fight that? Well, there's going to be a lawsuit uh, against that uh, against that bill. So I need 
people who have kids that are ages 12 to 17 to reach out to me um, because we need to line up the plaintiffs. We need to fight that bill quickly in the courts before parents, before 12 year olds can just walk out the door and parents don't see them again. There's, there's a couple things here, folks, if you're listening to this. You know, every parent I would recommend if you're dealing with anything, you can ask her direct questions. Uh, you're on Manek now, right? I think you talked to Lisa. Lisa, e- e- e. you can find Aaron on Manek. Rob, if you can put the link in the chat as well as in the description for people to see it, ask any questions you have on Manek, you can get a hold of her as well. There's a website called protectkidsca.com. Uh, they can also go to Ali. I want to come to you uh, for a completely different thing here. My wife and I, we're in, um, I don't know where we were at. We're having dinner somewhere. We're skiing, whatever. We were one of these mountains we're skiing. We go to this nice restaurant. This fellow comes and is serving us. Very nice guy. Extremely attentive. I love great servers who are paying attention. I don't need to tell them, you know, Arnold Palmer 80-20 iced tea, and it comes back, it's 80-20 lemonade. Just small little details that I like, okay? And refill, constantly refill. Doesn't let the glass stay empty for more than two minutes, and then boom, comes back and does it, right? And I'm like, so, you know, tell me about yourself. Yeah, I'm this, this, that. And then all of a sudden he opens up. He says, yeah, well, I'm gay and all these things. Like, okay, cool. So I said, tell me about your relationship with your dad. Oh, I hate him. Tell me why. He did this, 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 that. Everywhere I go, I'm a pattern guy. I'm a numbers guy. I'm curious. I ask questions. And one of the common trends you'll notice, especially with a boy, is a relationship with father that's either not there, it's missing, or when the boy was going through certain phases in his life that he was confused, that person wasn't there, fatherless homes. What was that experience for you as a young boy? Not today, as a young boy when you're going through where at some points you needed to talk to somebody, but you didn't have anybody. Yeah, I had a very difficult relationship with my father. He was very emotionally abusive and manipulative to my mother. So I would always witness him putting her down, making her feel worthless. And, you know, he would also do the same to me. Um, And, you know, if I would go against his word or if I didn't want to do something he wanted to do, you know, he would get very angry at me and put me down. So he was trying to mold me in his vision of the world, you know, to become like him. And I wanted to become like my mother. So that's why I kind of became attached to women and, you know, feminine figures as opposed to the masculine role model. So I didn't have that good masculine role model. And I think that was really a big part of the problem. And for many uh, people that do transition, there is uh, normally an issue with the family unit. So there's normally an issue with the father. Uh, Maybe they lack that strong role model. Maybe they have, you know, come from a broken home or they've suffered from something. So that really, really affected me. And, you know, he walked out of my family one day and, you know, never spoke to him since. And Never spoke to him since? Just walked out. How old were you when he walked out? Um, So I was in my early 20s when he did that. But he was always just leaving and not coming back for a long time. And, you know, he was was not nice. And, you know, I think that really played a big part in, you know, my confusion because I was like, I don't want to be like this person. I don't want to become like this this Mm -hmm. horrible man that is abusive to this person that I love, my mother, and abusive to me. You know, I want to become more like my mother and more feminine and soft and you know gentle so that really affected me and you know the family unit is such an important thing ali so let me let me ask you so somebody may be watching this as a father and they may say man shit, man, sometimes i'm pretty bad to my kids they'll improve okay cool and they'll make it work some some fathers may listen to this and they're like man psh, i haven't checked on my kid for a while let me call back okay let's just say that improve but you know some people who listen to this and they say that's right my dad wasn't there and he hasn't been there, and he was abusive, and the only person I ever experienced unconditional love from was my mom, and I want to be feminine, and I want to be this. What do you tell the person that doesn't have an example of, you know, how do you, what do you tell the boy that's like, this is exactly what I'm going through, and no one understands me, no one knows what I'm going through right now at that phase, because you think you're the only person that's going through this. What do you tell them? Right. Yeah. Most of these people, they do feel very isolated and alone. And it's very hard to know who to talk to because a lot of people these days, they bottle up their feelings or they maybe take to social media and they start to see these trends that are pushed on them. And then they get that confusion. They get depression. So we see a lot of mental health struggles right now. So, you know, I would just tell people, be strong, you know, find a purpose in life. I think that's very important, whether that's a, a career 
uh, that you want to do. You want to focus on a career, something studying or going to church or, or something or a sports, you know, get into sports. I think having a focus in life because, you know, a lot of people these days feel very lost. You know, they graduate from college. They don't know what to do with their lives. They're confused. You know, they might be confused with their gender. So, you know, you have to have something in your life that keeps you going, that gives you strength and have goals to set yourself to work towards. So, you know, a career or for me going to church, you know, weekly and going to Bible readings. I went to one yesterday in Palm Beach, you know, doing things like that is very motivating and it can keep you going, you know, when times are difficult. Ali, in UK, it's different than obviously in the States, but you've also said things about what's going on in US. You've made specific comments about, uh, you know, ex-transgender influencer, uh, uh, Ali London warns US needs to wake up to this child uh, danger. It's not right. So how different are things in UK versus what you're seeing in the States? So the U.S. is a lot more extreme in terms of transitioning kids. And you see uh, a huge number of cases in the U.S. There's around 1.6 million uh, people in America that identify as trans. And that has gone up by 600,000 just in the last few years. So we're seeing this sharp uh kind of increase. Um, the UK, we're seeing a lot of schools now being inf infiltrated with gender ideology and woke culture. And you know, it's really being pushed. And then obviously, social media is pushing that. Um, so we are starting to see a lot more of it. However, the UK's National Health Service did ban puberty blockers. Um, and they have made it very, very difficult for teens to get these hormones because at the end of the day, you know, people in the UK woke up and like, this is not fair. Kids cannot consent to this and you can't drive a car, you can't smoke. So, you know, people have woken up, but there are woke policies being pushed. Um, you know, for instance, the UK's National Health Service was allowing uh, transgender patients to be in women's only wards. So, you know, imagine if you've just uh, given birth or you've been through uh, sexual assault and you're in hospital and then you, ha you have a biological man next to you, that can be very upsetting for people. So, you know, the, the government has announced they are kind of stopping that and trying to protect women's spaces. And, you know, there's a real kind of cultural battle there. But whereas the US is a lot more extreme, obviously, you have uh, Republican states, you know, 19 have got legislation banning gender affirming care. Uh, whereas you look in, you know, places like New York or California, and there are so many kids being encouraged and incentivized to transition. I mean, you know, as Erin was saying in, in schools, you know, that is really the kind of the grand zero where this is happening, because you have groups of particularly girls in the same class, they are suddenly changing their pronouns, they're becoming trans, the teacher is then affirming that, and not even telling the parents. And you know, like in your case, you, you weren't aware of what was going on, because the, the teachers don't say so. It's a lot more extreme here. But I think a lot of people are waking up. And I think that's, you know, great what Luca is doing and Erin and, you know, for you as well, hosting this podcast today is speaking up because we can't be silent, you know, parents need to speak up because it's, it's now or never, you know, we're losing so many kids to this uh, transgender crisis. And we're going to see in a couple of years, you know, 1000s and 1000s and more kids detransitioning regret rate, and you know, they're going to be kind of is stuck of what to do. I'm going to ask a question, Tom, and I want you to go to yours. So here's my question for you. You know, uh, when I lived in Iran, uh, uh, it was always, you know, fashion comes from Italy to Iran. Whatever they were in Europe, then we wear, right? And then you live here, and you're thinking, well, U.S. has got to be more fashionable, right? No, it's really what Europe wears, and then we wear, right? Okay. And you've said whatever California does, everybody else will do in America, right? So if California gets to this place, odds are it's going to come to your state here very soon, right? Do you, do you from UK, do you see folks in UK who look at the states and California and says, oh, they're doing that? We should too because they're the cool people. Or do you guys look at US and he's like, these guys have lost their mind. What the hell are they doing? They're out of there. They're, we lead them, not the other way around. How do you view U.S. You well, know what I'm asking? Yeah, I mean, most of Europe, we always do follow U.S. trends, cause, you know, yeah, that's... in terms of Hollywood, in terms of what's cool on social media. Yeah. So we do often. But I think there's a lot of people that are more awake, a lot of parents and British people. They're quite outspoken. You know, they're, they're not afraid to say, look, this is wrong. And, you know, the parent will go to that school and say, stop teaching our kids this. And, you know, they will speak out against it, petition their member of parliament. So I think people are more proactive in speaking out, whereas in America, you have this very strong cancel culture. So, you know, anyone that speaks out can be fired. We've seen, you know, Christian teachers that have been fired and, and others that lose their jobs for misgendering a child or not affirming that child's gender identity. So, you know, whereas in the UK, we don't have such an extreme as in people are losing their jobs. Um, but we are seeing more and more young people, teenagers identifying as trans. And, you know, it's not just a trend where they're coloring their hair, they're actually physically wanting to cut off body parts and transition. And, you know, it, it's, we've always had trans people, you know, in the 80s and 70s, there have been examples throughout history of people 
people that have identified as the opposite um, gender. But what we're seeing now is a social contagion, which is being led by social media. And you know, social media is mostly American. It's Instagram, it's Facebook. Obviously, you have China, which has TikTok, which has played one of the most significant roles in this. But yeah, I think in terms of so social media trends, they do come from the US and seep into Europe. And you know, young people are being affected by that. Very articulate. I really appreciate your points. You you talked about your relationship with your parents, and then you're going into adolescence. Were you getting? Where was the social encouragement or social ratification? Because I see what you mean. Hey, you go to a psychologist, and all of a sudden, all they are is ratify, 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 ratify. Your your bad parents are there, so they're actually lobbying, not processing. Did you have at at the time? Was there? What were the social influences from school or whatever that were ratifying that helped? that helped you make that decision? Well, I was always uh, bullied uh, at high school and told that I was like a girl. You know, when I would go swimming, I used to have man boobs, so I would get really teased about that, and that really, really affected me. And then, you know, it made me have the mentality as, you know, was I born in the wrong body? Am I meant to be a girl? And then uh, in adolescence, I kind of just started doing surgery because I'd always had low self-esteem because of this, and that kind of became worse and worse. And then, you know, I started being a very heavy user on social media. So, you know, when Facebook came about, Instagram, MySpace back in the day, you know, that was kind of more innocent the back then. That was the best I know. Um, so yeah, and then within the last five years, you know, I became very addicted to social media, and obviously, you know, TikTok came around 2018, and that was when I really started to push myself and think, you know what, let me do this, let me do this transition, let me change my gender, and then you know, all I start to see is videos online, and you see somebody that transitions, they suddenly get praised, they get love, they get validation, and I was lacking that, and that was a big part of it. That's very interesting. Uh, we had a gentleman on a couple of weeks ago, Bob Woodson, that does a lot with at-risk youth. And one of the things that um, uh, churches in the inner city that were desperately trying to heal the gang situation pointed out that young men need love, discipline, and respect in big doses starting at age 12. And when they don't get it, the gangs provide that to them in almost the most opposite but perverse form. But I'm accepted, I'm loved, and I have discipline. And it's interesting we talk about youth needing some needing a magnetism needing to magnet to like a parent or a support and i think you all are talking about this in terms of what the kids need and but what they get how do you how do you identify what would have helped you early on to to kind of counteract that because a kid adrift is just going to connect whether it's the gangs or ratification on social media, what are the cues parents look for and how can they be involved? Because you all have had direct experience. Yeah, I mean, I think there are a variety of things. You know, school can be an influence. Obviously, I grew up in a different time, so we didn't have the trans trend in the schools. But again, uh, as I was growing up, you know, I started using social media back in the early days. And it was for me, it was that validation. So a lot of kids uh, simply they might be struggling with depression, with the way they look or even sexuality. We see now a lot of uh, people that would no normally be just be gay or lesbian. They are now becoming trans because they're being told that's the trend. So, you know, for me, it was that kind of um, confusion and people around me always telling me to be a girl so when you have a kid that's maybe lonely they've been bullied and you know they don't have kind of positive role models in their life you'd start to become adrift and then you start to want to kind of transform yourself completely uh, uh, look i got a question for you yeah you're uh, minnesota right mm -hmm. okay so uh, 21 years old born in 2002 okay it's me, me, but when you were at the age that you were tiktok was musically that's what you said earlier yeah um when the event took place and you're kind of going through the process where these surgeries are going to happen and you're coming home. How are your parents talking to you? Are your parents sitting there saying, babe, you sure you want to do this? Babe, are you sure you want to do this? Babe, you can think about it. Why don't you wait till you're 18? You know, you, you don't have to hurry up. We can wait to do this. What was your parents' approach with the decision you could make? So at the time, my so my parents were divorced and this is it was not a pretty divorce, which was almost kind of some of the catalyst of this because you look like when I was like 12, 13, 14, there was a lot going on. So, of course, I like retreated away from myself. Um, when did they go to what? How old were you when the divorce happened? So I believe I would have been 12. So the divorce, when the divorce happens, that means divorce been happening for a few years. When, <laughs> when did you kind of see like this is going to eventually happen? Let's just see how long they're going to take. Um, you know what I'm asking? I, I really didn't because they, okay, they, try, they tried they their best, it okay. but yeah. it was actually a right 
before they like officially got divorced, that's when I also got a smartphone um, because of the fact that they're like, okay, well, you're going to be switching back and forth between houses now. Um, you're going to like, this is might be helpful. And that's kind of the only reason I got one when I was like 12, almost 13. Um, but so two very different perspectives from my parents. Um, my, my mom did come with me with, come to me with some concerns. Um, and she was like, I, I'm scared you're going to regret this. She expressed this to the therapist I was seeing at the time. And that was shut down and she had private sessions with this therapist and they essentially talked her out of expressing those concerns like that to me. Um, meanwhile, you had the whole trans community kind of feeding it in your ear that if your parents don't immediately go along with all of this, if they don't affirm you, essentially, they're hateful. They're hateful people. And here's, Damn. I had I had no reason, you know, before that to believe that they were. And I, I, I feel like even as like a 16 year old, I tried my best to understand what they were going through. Now I, I will say it was from my, my lens of like my 16 year old brain. So probably not the most, um, you know, informed there, but, um, I, my mom had concerns. If my dad had any concerns, he never brought them forward to me. Um, he, but he, he my, my dad is very, very like I don't know, analytical, if that's the right word, where he was very like, okay, well, here's the medical professionals are telling me this is the problem and that's the solution. So we're going with it. Um, in that sense, he, there was also the fact that he, he liked having a special child that he could affirm for like the virtue points. Um, he did, which is, which is something I don't talk a ton about. Cause I, I try to, my, that's my ability to keep my family out of stuff. But he, my, my, my dad is a man who very much, uh, was very pr progressive in the sense of like, like a hardcore, like boomer progressivism. I, if, if anyone knows what I'm talking about there, um, un unpack that was that mean? It is just um, essentially like I am being told this is the nice and right thing to do. So I'm going to believe it wholeheartedly because um, I grew up being told that this is the good thing and this is what the good people do. And so I'm not going to question it. My, my dad watched CNN and MSNBC. All, he was just so mad all the time <laughs> throughout my high school years about, about stuff. And then he he did enjoy He'll never admit to it because he's kind of a textbook case of a narcissist. And if he's watching this because he knows I'm on it, hi, um, <laughs> don't talk to me. But <laughs> oh wow. Um, but no. So he he was he was a he was a case of really feeding into that affirmation cycle because of the fact that like he once again whether he admit to it or not he enjoyed having you know, the, the special kid that gives you political points when you affirm them and you are very virtuous with how you, how you present all this. Look at me. I'm such a good person. I have such a marginalized child and I am, I am affirming them all the way through and I'm sticking by this because this is now my struggle too. Um, and that actually got to a point where when I was about 17, but in right before I stopped switching houses, um, I, called my mom at one point and I was curled up on the bathroom floor of of uh, my bathroom at his house and I was on the phone with my mom and I was absolutely sobbing um, and I, I asked her why doesn't he love me for anything else besides being trans and that is where you see these parents and it, 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 it hits a special chord with me when you see these activist parents that have especially the young children that are affirming this because when these kids grow up and they get to that place where I was curled up on that bathroom floor um, talking to my mom, when they get to a place like that and they realize that they, their parents have essentially put all the eggs in the basket of, you know, this is what makes you amazing. This is what makes you special. This is great. I'm affirming you. That's going to break those kids. It's going to break them, especially if they, if, especially if this started at like six, seven, eight, nine, any of those younger ages, because I was a teenager. But imagine going your whole life with your parent telling you this and then coming to the realization that like they didn't seem to care about you for anything else besides that. Luca, let me, let me, let me ask you, <laughs> parents politically, are they both Democrats? Um, Yes, Minnesota. I, I well, so my parents are originally from Nebraska. I live in Minnesota now, Got it. Um, which is you want to talk about California? Minnesota is just the California of the Midwest. Um, but both my parents were, I believe, my dad's a Democrat. I think my mom is registered as an independent, but has voted Democrat. 
Got it. So this is why, uh, uh, Aaron, I know you you don't necessarily think, you know, agree with what I was saying on this side. I think there are certain people that choose their politics and whatever their political party affiliation, the loyalty to their political party and philosophy is above uh, any of it. Every parent is proud to brag about their kids. Not every parent. I would say most parents want to brag and say, that's my kid, because it's like a way you're bragging about yourself. It's your genetics. It's my blood. It's it's a, it's a different way you brag about your kids. But when you brag about it to show off to your party to say, I'm more liberal than you are. Look at me. Look how loyal I am to my political party. And I get these additional points that you don't get. Uh, being the fifth person that uh, uh, chose to sue uh, uh, the institution that helped, you know, got you to transition, are, are you all finding each other? And are you communicating others that are in a situation like you that went through what you went through? And if you were to put 50 stories on the board, are all 50 have the same six components, five components, three trends? Or are there different reasons why kids go through transitioning? Um, I just to, I guess add a mini asterisk to the the parent thing is it is it tends to be a certain personality type that uh, that this kind of ideology appeals to feeding into their ego. So it's not necessarily even politics. It is like a, if you have a narcissistic tendency, you're going to do anything to feed your ego. And unfortunately, this topic feeds their ego. Um, but to, I've, I've, yeah, I've met a lot of the other detransitioners. I've met most of the other ones that are, are filing lawsuits. And it's, it's really is amazing because I, I know, I know like the concept of diversity gets harped on a lot now because of how it's implemented. But detransitioners are truly one of the most like diverse groups of people I have ever been around. Um, you know, we're from different backgrounds, different races, different religions, different political beliefs. But all through all of our stories, there is a thread of these certain things that happen. And it's just woven in there. And that's kind of what is pulling us all together. Um, there's a thread of you know, events such as, you know, family life problems, sexual trauma, um, internalized or external homophobia, um, all of all of these things, just general being uncomfortable in puberty, social media and being like influenced by this stuff to feel accepted. But all through all of it, there is a there's a young person in each of these stories that just wanted acceptance and just wanted to feel loved and wanted and unfortunately for a lot of us that came from a very predatory place in our lives when you hear that what do you think about her that is really truthful so I, I run a parent group and all i need is the parent to give me the age and the sex of the child and i can guess the story and the story i'm, I'm usually spot on you know so when a parent comes in and they have a uh, a, a female teenager, I can say, not in the cool crowd, into anime, watch too much porn, uh, you know, hides in the room with social media. Like there, there are patterns and they're so obvious to us. If it's a boy, I've got a different pattern. These boys are highly intelligent, usually Asperger's on the spectrum somewhere. Um, they're usually uncomfortable around girls, never had a girlfriend. So there's these really stunning patterns that we see day in and day out that the doctors seem to just ignore. So we see them. And it and it pray and you know, Luca's right, it preys on the vulnerable kids. These are not the kids that are great at sports or in the popular group. These are the kids that are fringe and outliers and are looking for a tribe or are looking for love from both their friends and sometimes from their parents. And then they can opt into this stardom. I mean, when you are a quote unquote trans kid, you are celebrated. You become the it person, even though the kids still shy away from you. So you'll see a, a boy who will become prom queen or homecoming queen. He's not invited to the after party. But, you know, all the kids are celebrating this, this boy in a dress, but it's all a f false celebration. You know, it's interesting you say that because we're starting to see people waking up to this. Bill Maher woke up and Bill said, 
that he was alarmed, and he did a little monologue on it, that he said around, he said, Angelinos, which is people from Los Angeles, he says, I'm starting to see Angelinos at cocktail parties speaking with pride about having a kid that's transitioning, and they're like, oh, what, what drama, as if, you know, they, you know they're, they're just talking casually about some topic, you know, you know and he, him being very alarmed by that. You just talked about, about patterns you can see in kids. What patterns do you see in parents? Well, like Lucas said, narcissistic parents, parents who want to, I mean, there is a political component of it. You know, Democrats, liberals, how liberal can you be? You're so liberal that you're accepting that your child is actually the opposite sex. I mean, that's a, you know, it's a badge of honor, right? Um, and, and these parents can show how, how woke they are and accepting they are on this. So, yeah, there's a lot of narcissism. I mean, you see the, you see the parents who are parading their quote-unquote trans kids around. I mean, that's a, you know, especially the little kids. Now, those parents are as narcissistic as they come. They're sick, though. These are sick people. They have issues. They're, they're, mm -hmm. You can say narcissistic all you want, and we can call them all these other categories. Let's just simplify it. You are sick. You have issues if you are using your kid to advertise, you know, uh, uh, as a prop. Hey, look who I am as a parent. You have mental issues. You're the one with mental issues, not your kids. You're using your kids yeah. to fill your own gaps. Um, I, I, I don't have any forgiveness for them. I, I mean, for the, for the parents who are parading the young kids around, I, I don't have any forgiveness. They are foisting this on these children, and they are using these children as props. I mean, you can listen to every parent who says that they have a, a trans young kid, and, and the stories are all the same. My son played with Barbies. Big deal. I played with trucks. <laughs> um, I, I would just add to that also is one of those things when you think about um, th these adults who are very affirming and, and you th give it like more than more than two seconds of thought. Why would you want to be the adult that when a young person comes to you and they are they are distressed and they are they are saying every single thing is wrong with me down to my very being down to my very body. Why would you be the adult in the room to look that kid in the eyes and say, yes, you are right. Everything is wrong with you. And we're going to we'll take you and get all this stuff done to you to fix you. Why would you be that adult? How is that loving or caring to look that young person in the eyes who is so distressed that they want to escape their very physical body and tell them that, yes, you are correct. Everything is wrong with you. Well, you just said it. It's like that that parent has got deep insecurities and issues of their own. And we're talking about the kids and their emotional things and all this. But it's the parents have got all, their own basket. But, but you know what I think about that, Tom? Here's, here's what I think about. You know, again, off uh, camera, we spoke for two minutes. And I feel like we had a podcast off camera. To me, I said common sense. Uh, you know, you have common sense. You know this shit's not, uh, you know, uh, uh, normal for you to do what you're doing with your kid. But, but here's, here's where I go to as well. Um, so think, let's be deceptive for a second and let's play devil's advocate and let's play the, the motives of some people who are dark. Let's just say those people exist, okay? How do you do it? It's not a new strategy. Sun Tzu talked about it many years ago, divide and conquer. Okay, so how do we do it? Divide parents. Great. Divorce rate in the U.S. is the highest in the world. Awesome. Let's divide parents. We're killing it. That's not the case in China. It's 3%. It's not the case in India. It's 4%. We're at freaking, you know, whatever. What's the divorce rate in the U.S.? If you pull it up, it's absolutely embarrassing. So let's divide parents. One. Bingo. We're winning. Number two. Let's divide sexes. We're doing that. Let's divide them. Let's pin men against women. Freaking awesome. Look at these guys. They hate each other. The feminist movement, greatest thing ever. Women coming out seeing the enemy of the state number one is men. This is who we're let's 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 wage a class war. You know, let's let's make the poor hate the rich and the rich hate the poor. Let's do that. And then what happens? Protesting, destroying businesses, the people that create jobs, they're destroying small. They go, look at this, we're winning. This is so awesome. And then you got to also kind of, you know, get values out. The, the, the fewer, the fewer, like I'm watching this interview with this guy. Rob, do you have this interview with this, um, this child molester who is being interviewed and he's given his clues on what he does? He says, I look at kids who are not close with their parents, who don't have a strong father figure. 
uh, 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 I'll send you the video here in a minute, so we don't have to play it. It's not a big deal. But one of the things he talks about, this is a guy that did 12 years, two or three years in jail, and he went in for being a child molester. And he's being interviewed. He agrees to do an interview on what his strategy is, okay? And he said he looked for clues. Strong father, he wouldn't even waste his time, okay? Believed in God, wouldn't, this guy right here. How many minutes is it? Two minutes and 11 seconds? What channel is this with that we can play it or not? Is, can you see what this is? It's just a regular thing. This is such a long time ago. Okay, go ahead and play it. See what this guy says. If you can put the audio up. I found my victims moving from town to town. Um, Convicted child predator. I scoped predator. them out on um, school grounds. I scoped them out in Little League Diamonds. Um, I scoped them out in my own backyards, my neighborhoods, and things like that. Um, I worked with people who had younger brothers. I socialized with those people so I could get in touch with their younger brothers and begin the grooming process. And um, eventually, it would take time, but I knew what I was doing. It was all calculated. I mean, this is nothing that happened overnight. You know, I knew, and I planned it all. It started out where I would move from one town to another. When I got located in one town, um, I would, you know, survey the children in the town to see. It was always a small town. It was never a big one um, because big towns have big police forces, and big police forces tend not to be very friendly. Small towns have small police forces. You know, they probably never even heard of a child molester or a sex offender or never even had to deal with one. I knew that. At least I played upon that. And um, I got involved in Little League Baseball because I knew from my high school wow. days that I could umpire Little League Baseball. I could umpire baseball. I was good at it. I was good at refereeing basketball and other sports because I could not play worth a crap in high school. But I enjoyed the sport so much. You can pause this, Rob. This is not the clip. This, this is a longer interview. One of the clips he talks about what he looked for. But this is the thing that I think about. If a father or a mother caves to this nonsense, you don't really have core values and principles that you stand by. Because a person that has real, true values and principles, you can't break them. You just, you, the person's going to be like, no, I'm good. I'm not going to do it. Yeah, I'm, 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 not, I'm not okay with this. So the same way they divided between men and women, the same way they divided between husband and wife, the same they divided between the job creators and the people that the, the class war that we're talking about financially, is the same way they're saying, hey, guys, we don't need church in schools. We don't need prayer in school. We don't need to believe in a God. We don't need to. So I need to believe in LGBTQ is what you're saying, but I don't need to believe in God. Got it. So your God was replaced by this LGBTQ nonsense, and then gradually you go in there, and if you are able to get me to not believe in God, what do I no longer have? I no longer have faith. A community of people that no longer have faith, whether the Bible is true or not, whether Jesus is real or not, whether your faith is real or not, I don't have faith anymore. The moment I don't have faith anymore, you have a, a, a crack in the argument. I can get in there and, and play my manipulative game. But if a group of people have faith, how do I go up against a community like that? So I see, I see a lot of this trend as well happening because think about it this way you're a liberal 30 you said 36 37 years i don't know what the timeline was 30 plus years uh democrat you said you're not voting democrat in 2024 that's what you said you said you're voting republican 2024 but how come how come you don't notice republican parents being okay with transitioning it doesn't happen that often it's few of them how come it's mainly Democratic parents that are doing this. I'll come to you in a second. How come it's mainly Democratic parents that are doing this? What is typically the, if you were to say which one has a side that believes in God more or less, generally it's going to be more Republicans that believe in God than Democrats. Okay. So if you're a Republican, you probably go to an institution where somebody's preaching every week and they're given a certain set of values and principles. Then you eventually are like, well, that's kind of my value and principle as well. Then you're not going to let somebody bully you. And you're not going to break. And like, there's no way we're going to be doing something like this to our kids. I'm going to stand firm on this. But Democrats, you're probably not going to a church on Sunday. You probably don't have a certain, you know, religion. Not all. I'm not telling all. I'm purely talking uh, percentages. This data is out there as well. 
So it's an easier target to go after. So if an institution wants to go after a community to transition their kids, Democrats are the best targets. Republicans are the worst. Go ahead. I think you were going to say something, Luca. Um, I was I was just going to say, well, you, you talk about religion. And when you look at how essentially this entire social movement, whether it be the trans things or the surrounding little bubbles that are kind of tied to it, um, it, it fits what these people see as essentially a non-theistic religion. So religion where there is there is no... There is no God, but it fits having, you've heard the, the phrases trans, kid or, trans kids are sacred, trans people are holy. You are going through essentially all of these steps of a religion, wow. except you are, do not have a God that you're praying to in the end of this. They are worshiping every day on social media because they've made this their religion. This is dark. And you can see in the fervor that they talk about things that they believe it. It is, and you have people like James Lindsay who talk a lot about this. He was just at a conference we were at this past weekend. Um, but essentially the entirety of modern day progressivism, especially in like my age, like college, I'm 21, so like college kids age, um, this, this, not only do they not have a religion, they've replaced it with this being their religion. And when you think about it like that, that is a lot more sinister because that is a lot more um, that you have to break down to even have that conversation. And that is why you see where they don't have that conversation. No debate is a phrase that is used on this topic a lot. There is no debate because they believe in their heart of hearts that they know 100% what they're doing is right. And that is a quote from a direct doctor who put a clip out on Twitter saying that. They believe it. It is not, they don't care that the science is awful and weak and very low evidence. That doesn't matter on this topic because they believe in it. By the way, you're in college right now. I, I am not. Um, I so I had to take a break last spring from because of health issues um, caused by my transition. I had to pull out because I my, my joint pain and pelvic pain so bad I couldn't get out of bed. Um, but honestly, um, best decision I've ever made. I I went to a school where. The, the medical students during their white coat ceremony called biological sex an oppressive construct that needs to be dismantled. I had a professor tell me that Charles Darwin's theory of evolution is directly responsible for generational trauma. I don't think you guys realize just how bad it is. However bad you think it is, it's worse. <laughs> we do, by the way, it's crazy. You're think, I'm, I'm sure you're thinking our conversation this last week with, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, yeah. I do. So, go ahead, please. Well, and also, I mean, if you think about transgenderism, there's a gendered soul. This is what they say, that there's a gender essence. So they're actually, transgenderism is a new religion. It's based on faith in intangible, and you are a true believer. We hear that terminology too. You are a true believer. And detransitioners are just the apostates, and boy, oh boy, do we get treated like them to the, to the point where... In some like reading lists that have been put out for what would help detransitioners, you have cult deprogramming books in them. Like that is something that has been recommended to me over and over again. Like, have you ever read books by people who have escaped a cult? That might help you. Um, Why? Detransitioners yeah, are treated the way that like apostates to a hostile religion would be treated. Wait, wait, wait. unpack that for me. So you're saying like, so for example, you have transitioned. Mm -hmm. Now you want to leave. They fear you leaving yes. because it's going to show a, you know, a leak in their argument and right. they have to prevent you from leaving. That's why they're recommending these books. They, they it is essentially the word detransition is a very, very scary one to the trans community to the point that the first therapy appointment I went to after, after I detransitioned, because I was like, okay, I'm going through it. I should probably like, you know, go find someone to talk to, um, in that first therapy appointment, she, um, the therapist was like, well, have you tried just identifying as non-binary or essentially anything else that wouldn't make me a detransitioner? Because that is a very scary term to them. And they downplayed a lot with, oh, it's only a small percentage. We don't know the actual percent because they don't keep track of it. Detransitioners don't go back to the scene of the crime or to the doctor where this happened. Um, why would you? Why would you go back? to the place that the darkest moments in your life were affirmed into reality. A point. And I hear a lot of negative words in the research coming up this, and I didn't even realize how negative they were, but you just saying that clicked with me. I was seeing things like, I'm stuck in a woman's body. I'm trapped. Those are highly negative words, like I'm imprisoned. Like you need to be liberated. You need to find this other faith. The... Um 
The concept the psychology yeah. of that is really dark. The concept in transgenderism, and this is this is also applies to broader other similar social movements, um, of that you are not your body, you are simply in it, like like Aaron mentioned, like a gendered soul, <laughs> that you are living in your body. You are not your body. You are physically not connected to this thing, that your brain and your body can be completely separated and have no effect on each other at all. Oh, this is just my vessel. Is, this I'm is here. Your vessel is a good way to put it. Is essentially one of the most dangerous things we are teaching young people because they are they are hearing this that you are just you know you hear it you hear outside of you know outside of transgender well you hear i'm living in a female body i'm living in a you know black body or fat body any of these other movements um and the separation of the self from your physical being has to be one of the most harmful things we are telling young people that i do not see discussed nearly enough because part of you know, accepting and part of my detransitioning was realizing I am my body and, you know, that's OK. And sometimes that's going to suck. But you know what? It's worth it because that's having two feet in reality and remending that break that is being taught to young people of mind and body, remending that so they can actually feel whole is what we need to be doing. But instead, we currently live in a culture that is further, further <coughs> separating the two. This is powerful. This is powerful too. As you brought up, I got the, the chills all over my body. By the way, I, I have, I have complete chills. The, the the pedophile aspect of this too. Let let let's put this body dissociation is what Luke is talking about. I'm I'm sure Ali, you you experience body dis, dissociation. It is what is being taught actually to our kids. So you are not your body. So think about this. And this happened in in my personal situation is that my daughter was being coached online. As soon as she put on Instagram, female to male, this is a calling card for pedophiles. Yep. Pedophiles look at this girl and they say she is vulnerable. She is disassociating with her body. She's claiming that her body is not actually hers. She's my target. So 100%. What, yeah, they go after them and they and they ask these young girls to um, sell naked pictures of themselves uh, because after all, they're going to get those breasts removed anyway. So why not use them for some cash? This is a real thing that is happening. They also look at these young girls and say, let's get her on testosterone because you know what testosterone does to a female? It turns all the no's into yeses. It turns us into, you know, or women into being much more promiscuous than one would be because we don't have that, that hormone in the same way that men do. I mean, we have testosterone in our bodies, but n not to the effect that you do. And so you pump a young girl with testosterone and you're going to have a very promiscuous young girl. So this is all designed, this is all related to pedophilia also. Um, and they take advantage of the, this is not your, this is not your body. And this is where also belief is more important. Trans women are women. That's based on what they believe. And also there's a desensitization. I mean, if you look at a pride event, you know, you see a sexualization, you see people in fetish gear, bondage, BDSM on the streets, and there will be kids there. There are so many examples this summer during pride, and it's desensitizing people to think that's perfectly normal and perfectly acceptable. And we should not be allowing that in society. And it has all the signs of a cult. I mean, you know, in cults, they sexualize and target young children. That's one thing. Uh, the people in the cult recruit members. So they take to TikTok, they take to Instagram to recruit new people to join the trans cult. And then if you leave that cult, you are a suppressive person, just like with Scientology, for instance, you become a suppressive yeah. person and they will target you. So if you suddenly announce you've detransitioned online, you are a target of hatred. If you're a woman that says, sorry, I don't feel comfortable with you in my uh, restroom, you are also targeted. So it's about that kind of suppressive person targeting and the sexualization has become normalized. This is so interesting because in faiths, if you think about, if you think about faiths around the world and people call them religions, faith, but in the Judeo-Christian tradition, so that includes Mormons, Catholics, Protestants, it's a very large bucket. They're very clear that the soul and body are together, and their scripture says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made and as the unit. And when you pass away, your spirit is where you know we all go to heaven in, in that, that, that belief structure. And what they're doing is they're breaking that up prematurely into that you're, you're, how you're made, how you're born could have had some flaw. And that is just, to me, I'm just sitting here thinking about this, 
that is so striking in the destructiveness of self. No wonder suicide follows in these percentages, because you're now you're now somehow conning them into believe that how you were born was somehow a mistake, rather than there's a goodness in you that needs to be found. And in the Judeo-Christian tradition, the most important three days, the day you're born, the day you decide to follow God, and the day you find out why you're here and what you're going to do as you do so. You see the power in that and the goodness of where you're going to find in yourself versus them breaking all this. This is I'm having an epiphany here listening to you, and it's not a good one. Um, I was also going to say the separation of like one's mental state from their body, just like Aaron mentioned, is essentially a predator's dream to have someone so disassociated and so desensitized that they don't care what happens to their physical body because they see their physical body that can be interchanged like Legos. Um, and I say this as one of, one of the catalysts that led me to disassociate so heavily that I was like, I, th- I thought it was meant to be a boy, was the fact that I was preyed, on, preyed upon online in several of these in trans spaces where these adults see that you have young people who hate their body and are heavily disassociating from it and they will prey upon it. They use very similar lines of don't let your parents find out, then you'll be in trouble. Your parents are the bad people here. They are, they don't understand you. I do. And they will tell you that over and over again. Let me ask this question. You're a lawyer, okay. And when something like this happens to your kid, you're going to spend, how many hours have you spent studying the whole motive, everything that's going on with this? How many hours have you put into this whole thing since that happened with your daughter? Two years. Okay. So give me, give me total hours. What's hours? What would you say? Actual hours? A couple thousand hours? Easy. Easy. Okay. So here's, here's my question. My question is motive. Right. Yesterday we're at the debate and we're watching all these guys and we're watching everything that's going on and we're kind of studying what's going on with the marketplace right now. And what is the motive of this person saying this? What is the motive of that person doing this? What is the motive of this? Okay, the motive here is that guy wants to make money off of me. Okay, cool. I get it. Great. What's the motive of this guy? This person wants to get close to you because they're trying to get close to a person that works with you and you want them to introduce you to her because they really like her. All right. So you want me to endorse you that you can. Okay. I get your motive. I want motive. What is the motive of trans? What is the motive of going to the kids? Is it a, is it purely business? Because we just read the numbers, how big it is, right? The 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 uh, uh, hormone hormone replacement, replacement 10. therapy ten point two billion in twenty nineteen. It's going to be higher than that today. You got the male to female gender reassignment surgery is a hundred and ninety million dollars in twenty nineteen. And just getting warmed up. And getting warmed up. We can say finances, but it's got to be more than that. What do you think it is? So it's, this is why it's so difficult to destroy because it's a multi-headed hydra. So you have the money. There's huge amounts of money. I mean, we have uh, David Sachs, um, his uh, craft ventures just uh, invested in Plume, the online seller of uh, hormones that targets kids, even though it's supposed to be 18 above. It targets kids because I lurk in that space. There's a huge amount of money in ESGs. So everyone, or all these companies think that they're getting good guy points for ESGs. Well, fixing their environmental um, footprint is really expensive. Social's very inexpensive. Governance is is relatively inexpensive. So they're picking the social. So they'll they'll throw a pride parade. I mean, that's how they can get their good guy points. Um, so you have money. I mean, there are. You're right. There are. There's billions of dollars riding on vulnerable kids and vulnerable adults, because this is adults too. We can't actually stop at 18, 18 to 25. This stuff should be banned. Most of these kids are autistic. Most of them have mental health issues um, going back years that are not being resolved. So we have money. So we, that's an easy one to figure out. We also have government funding this. In the state of California, we have to the tune of multitude of millions of dollars pouring into this industry, whether they're building new foster care facilities for these kids that they're stealing from parents, um, whether it's anti-hate and they're siphoning this off to NGOs or nonprofits. So the money is a huge part of it. Then we just talked about the sex because sex and money go together just like, you know, peas and carrots. Um, There's always a sex component of it. Like I said, when you take these vulnerable girls and boys I mean, you pump a boy with... Sex as what? Sexual desires or sex? What do you mean by sex? Okay, in in two ways. So the boys, they're pumping these boys with puberty blockers. Their bodies never grow into a man body. They have 
micro-sized um, penises, um, and, and they never grow. And this is a fetish movement. So the top porn right now is transgender porn. So these men could be 30 years old, but they look like little boys. And you, you have um, like links back to like that aspect of it on even like the top sites. You have WPATH, which is World Professional Association for Transgender Health, I believe is the, what the acronym stands for. Um, on their latest guidelines, they advocated that eunuch is a valid gender identity even for children. And if you followed the links back that they first posted, it went directly to a fetish site of grown men talking about how they wanted to castrate young boys. Wait, what? Y eunuch? Eunuch. Eunuch. For real, for real, for boys. That so that's a, ca a castrated male, essentially, is what a eunuch is. Um, yeah, it goes back to history where the Egyptians in, wanted strong men to protect the queen, but they would castrate them so that they couldn't hook up with the and queen. And you, ha you, you have the top World Professional Association for Transgender Health, so WPATH, then their latest guidelines were advocating for eunuch as a valid gender identity. And you linked back... And it linked. You check the link on it. That I doubt it's still up now because I'm sure they no, tried. To, I'm sure they tried to wipe it. Did they keep no, it up? No, it's 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 still there. So oh, we God. have um, sex, money. We have um, culling the herd. We have eugenics, because we had a detrans awareness, uh, you know, event. Ten out of the eleven detransitioners were there were autistic. If they went through with their transition, they would all be sterilized. So let's call the herd. Remember, Planned Parenthood is the biggest seller of, of cross-sex hormones, and Planned Parenthood had its genesis in eugenics, sterilizing the deplorables, the unwanted, um, the poor, the mentally unwell. So you have that aspect of it. And then we have queer theory, which is the destruction of everything that's normal, the destruction of the family when my child was going through this, she was told to call me by my first name so that she, I was no longer mother so she could separate. This is, a, a, this is designed to blow away everything that is good in the world. We see queer theory going on right now when you see all these uh, protests in, in support of Hamas. Um, this is queer theory again. It has to keep queering. It, they have to keep... Um, finding something that's good and destroy it. Destroy the family, destroy the child, destroy education, keep destroying. It's designed to keep snowballing until there's nothing left of our society. First Amendment being destroyed. But why though? Actually go why? Because, okay, the same people that want to do this, they also want to make money, okay? If you destroy society, you're no longer going to make money. You're going to you're gonna lose a lot of your money. Why would you do that? Like you can't have a society of people that are not working, that are, you know, that that can't be a net positive to society. Why would they do that? Well, that's where the the aspect of belief comes in, at least in my opinion, is one in the in the transgender aspect, you are making a permanent patient out of someone. So even if like, oh well, you can't have kids. No, okay, then we'll just push you down the line to IVF or surrogacy or anything else that will provide money. Um, it is making a permanent patient because medicalization in this sense breeds medicalization. You know, you have complications from surgery, better have another surgery. You're still uncomfortable with something, better have another procedure. You have, you know, you have side effects from taking hormones. Well, we got to get you on more medication to fix that. Um, you know, it, it's all of this stuff. And it is it is essentially, when when we talk about essentially, you know, ruining or queering the normal, it is taking a perfectly healthy body and destroying it. And, and the money, the money's coming from people of our generation. Those of us who, who worked, you know, 10, 12 hours a day and worked their tails off, we're paying for all of this. Eventually that money will dry up, so it will end. Uh, but they're taking our tax dollars and using our tax dollars to harm, harm kids um, and to pay for these medical interventions, using that term loosely. In, in California and, and in most states, Medi-Cal pays for this. So those are our tax dollars being used. When you're paying for your private insurance, your private insurance is paying for this. You're pa we're paying into this. Ali, I don't, I mean, you had so many surgeries. Were they paid by your? No, I paid myself. You yeah. had to pay yourself. So NIH didn't do that? Uh, no, 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 not for, um, because I was changing my nose, like I had six nose jobs, I was doing jaw feminization, they weren't doing that, no. 
NIH, Tom. He's in London. A National Health <laughs> Service, yeah, NHS, yeah. yeah. He's sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so the motive is based on what you're saying is money, ESG, social, sex, boys are being pumped, uh, puberty blockers because their body now grows to human bodies, micro penises, top porn sites is transgender porn. You were going to give a second point under sex. What was the second one? Well, then the other thing is then there's another, as as Luca was, was bringing up too, is there's money made on the front end and there's money made on the... Oh, God, like a pipeline of a funnel of other products I can sell you? It is a, a nonstop. So also... A, I'm going to get a little deep here, but with the parents, so you 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 break up the parents and the child. So the child runs away, goes into foster care, or or goes a glitter family. Yes, but the parent has to take all these parenting courses. So the parent is always spending money in the court systems and hiring people and hiring attorneys to try to get their child back. They never get their child back. There's so much money in this. It's kind of hidden money. Um, the prisons are paying for all these gender uh, transformations for men so that they can get into women's uh, women's prisons. Again, like Plume, um, the hormone company is is uh, working with Stork. So they take they sterilize you, and then they buy you a baby when you want one. So there's so much money to be made on on people's misery over and over and over again. I mean, the detransitioners, like Luca said, the doctors don't even know what to do to help her. They they don't. I so I went when I first detransitioned, I I went to a doctor that was at the gender clinic at my current university because I was like, you know, I got off testosterone. I was like, I need blood work done. I need to see where my levels are. I knew exactly, you know, like what I needed for that. Um, just to see what 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 damage was done essentially is what I needed to see, and um, I went there and I, I was very candid. I just I just explained everything to this doctor. I'm like, this is what is going on, and um, she she looked at me and she said, you know, um, I, I want I want to help you, but I have no idea what to do with you. There's no protocol for this, and I I am actually also one of the detransitioners who went back to their original doctor, which is not very many of us. And what did the original um, doctor say? This is just the next step on your gender journey. Wow, um, is what I is what I got told, and no, no real help was offered. Um, and here's the thing: like at the time I went back to that clinic, I was still pretty newly detransitioned, and I I would have been willing to like, okay, you know what? Maybe maybe this doctor's different. Maybe she will help me. Maybe she would understand. And instead, she looked mildly panicked through like the Zoom call because this wasn't even in person. Um, she looked mildly panicked that I even brought up that I didn't think I could consent to this stuff. Um, at, at 16 with all my mental health issues going on and told me that this is the next step of my gender journey and then I had to pay for the Zoom call appointment, which was a lot. And I'm sorry, I was going to make a point regarding that. So also these hospitals, they don't want to treat detransitioners de because it makes their statistics and data look bad. So you see all of these clinics, trans activists, they'll claim there's a 1% detransition rate. Why do you think that is? It's because they're not actually treating them. They just send them out the door. Sorry, we can't help you. We can't reconstruct your breast. The Medicaid or Medicare isn't going to pay for that reconstruction. So they don't want those wow. statistics. And, you know, that's what trans activists always argue. There's a 1% detransition rate. But we know there are so many. There's a, a Reddit group online with 50,000 people in a detransition forum. I believe it's higher than that. Now. It's higher now. This, this is the medical economy. This is the dark side of the medical economy that we all saw during COVID where hospitals mm -hmm. wanted to declare deaths related to COVID because it helped them help their statistics and their federal grant money on the other side. So there's this whole dark economy. That's the word that keeps coming to mind as I'm listening to you. It's like there's this dark economy, the dark trans economy. It's pure arrogance, by the way, to say uh, the, this is what a Wikipedia, the transition is more common in the early stage of transition, particularly before surgery. The share of trans people who <laughs> detransition is unknown, which estimates generally ranging as uh, less than 1%. To as many as eight percent, and then right below that, of course, you have the gender GP link. Um, it which is, is what? It is, which is what? It is Go a, to the gender GP links. Let's see what a, that is. A trans. It's a trans. It's a trans activist um, group. But it's it's funny because some of the major studies on studying quote unquote detransition uh, don't even include it. Like didn't even include people who actually. Um, identified as detransition, like there was the like national transgender survey that was going around around this time last year, um, and by virtue of being a detransitioner and no longer being part of that, you could not even respond. Meaning that they do not, they are not even counting detransitioners in this number because it was supposed to gauge how well how many people are there. 
Um, and then you don't get an answer of, okay, well, here's how many detransitioners there are. I'm, I'm trying to look up the, how, just how many people are now in the, in the detrans subreddit. Cause even since I joined it last year, it is, it is shot up. Um, is that number public? Can it we, is, can it we is, see that? it is public. So it currently has 51 K members on r slash detrans. Um, on the D-Trans members, 51,000 members. 51K members on r slash D-Trans. And, and last year, it was, uh, it was 37,000. Um, so it keeps growing. I it mean, keeps it, growing. it just keeps growing. And there is, one, there is one study that they did through the military where they showed the number of military personnel that went on cross-sex hormones and then stopped coming for their cross-sex horm hormones. And that's 30%. So they're hiding, they're hiding the true numbers because, again, it's a cult and they can't have anybody saying that transition isn't great. The, the D-Trans subreddit is what I, you know, I lovingly refer to as one of the most depressing places on the Internet. Um, the, the, the what? The, one of the most depressing places this on the, the Internet. This is the GP trans? No, the D-Trans subreddit. Why is that? Because there is a we, – we have each other, but aside from that, there is a total lack of hope. Is something you find in D-trans communities. You have people who are suffering so many health problems caused by as many of them were going through the darkest time in their lives when they were pulled into all this thing. Many of them were children. And you you see them come out the other end and they are just broken and desperately searching for some thing to hold on to and all this. They are desperately searching for some hope it gets better. And some hope that it, you know, that there is help out there when you have a medical system that is looking us in the eyes and telling us that it doesn't want to help us, that we are just the collateral damage for a social movement, that it doesn't care how many of us are hurt. And you go to this forum and you read the stories of the actual people who have been hurt by this, the actual human lives that have been destroyed by this treatment. And the fact that you just, you just see the activists that are just like collateral damage. And then you have to ask how many people will be enough for them to actually care? How many? Because this has, like Aaron was talking about, I think you even were paying attention to these trans celebrate before even ID transitioned. Um, and you just, you look at, you look at the numbers shooting up of people, people doing this and you see the real harm that's caused and you wonder how many more people are going to be hurt until you you know, give a crap and notice and maybe even acknowledge that something has gone wrong here. The horrifying irony of this is so massive to me right now that these people are authentically hurting, authentically physically harmed by the treatments and the drugs and the medications, and they're in this dark place, which is what they wanted you to believe you were in at the start. I, I never- Oh, you're lost. Had... No one cares about you. We do. I, I never was truly suicidal until I, I detransitioned and was having to deal with the real consequences of things like joint pain so bad I couldn't get out of bed last winter, of things like pelvic pain so bad I was curled over in the curled up in the fetal position on the couch, until realizing that I may have destroyed my chance completely of having children, until realizing that parts of my body are gone, that there was nothing wrong with. There was nothing wrong with my body and it was cut up. And having to come to terms with that, and God, thank God, I'm in a much better place now, and thank God I have people in my life and some of the other detransitioners that like understand what I'm going through. But the medical industry has essentially created a, you know, a destroyed subset of human with lifelong health issues and lifelong almost trauma surrounding their body now, and kicked them out the back door because it doesn't look good on their stats. Here, here's the thing, too. I get phone calls from detransitioners that are suicidal. The, I mean, they are literally suicidal. They call me. I can't go on. I won't leave my house. I don't know what I am. I have removed all my body parts. There's a young man in San Francisco who called two Fridays ago. Um, he was in a psychotic break moment when he... Uh, let them uh, remove his genitals. He's 29. He's a straight guy. What do I say to him? What do I say to him to help keep him alive after the doctors have done this to them? And like Luca said, and then they throw him to the curb. Sorry, we can't help you. It was your decision. 
your autonomous decision. We were just the surgeons. We just did what you said to do. I mean, these doctors need to be held to account. First, do no harm. We do not have cafeteria-style medical procedures. You can't walk in. I mean, we shouldn't, no one should walk in and say, hey, I want my body parts removed. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. And this is often the only support these kids have is going to these D-trans forums or you know, there's very little support because what happens just going back to the cult is if that person speaks out online, firstly, they get cancelled, they get bombarded with hate. So that's in an effort to silence them. Secondly, we have to remember if they're trans, most of their friendship circle is likely still going to be trans or non-binary. So for them to go against their friends is basically, you know, they're going to be blacklisted, they're going to be completely cancelled. So they have no want to speak to so that's why they go online they're speaking with people anonymously and they can't get that mental health support and you know they are really struggling with their mental health what got you through it you talk about faith a little bit but what got you through these days um to be honest it was really really tough you know i went through some very dark times you know doing all these crazy crazy surgeries you know being left with the scars and it was really really tough and one of the things that helped me is kind of having reminiscence therapy so you kind of think back to when you were young you know happy memories so when i was a little kid i would you know revisit visit places I went to like museums or you know farms or fields and stuff and having that reminiscent therapy and I went to a church I went to as a kid with my school and you know, I went there and I was rekindling these happy memories and thinking you know what? I was a happy person back then I've been miserable for about 20 years I need to snap out of it so you know the faith was and just having that purpose in life and I thought you know what what I'm doing is a bad role model you know I'm taking to TikTok I'm trans I'm sharing this online and stuff and that could actually hurt someone that could actually influence someone. Uh, I, I, w I want to do two things, okay? If, if we're already this far along, uh, <clears throat> I, w I want to uh, explain it as well. So women who go through the transition of being a man, okay, you explained the surgery. What was it called? It's, it's uh, uh, What was the name of it? Uh, uh, phalloplasty? Phalloplasty. Phalloplasty. And Tom explained this to me for the first time yesterday. I had no clue that's how they did it, by the way, where they cut a... Mm -hmm. You, uh, a, a, you know, uh, the Hor horrifying, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Can you, and then, and for women, uh, for men being, uh, uh, girls where if you don't constantly, you know, do certain procedure, it could shut down. Then you can't pee. Then you have, you know, all these other things that you could be dealing with w when one wants to go through that procedure, what does that procedure look like? See, um, when it, well, when it comes to the, the female to male identifying one, um, fr from my understanding is it is a series of surgeries, um, that like it, it takes a, it takes a graph and it leaves behind a ton of scarring, whether it be on your forearm or I believe on your thighs in another place. I, to, to be honest, I never looked into it because it, even when I was like, believed I was trans completely, I was like, well, that is absolutely horrifying. I don't want that done. Um, oh no. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's terrifying. It is, these have such high, they have such high complication rates too. You see people going in revision after revision after revision. You see, you see surgeons that always do like a terrible job and are known to do a terrible job of these things in the community, except trans people are shut down whenever they talk about their health issues or like these bad surgeons because they think it's going to look bad on the rest of the community. And that is why r slash D trans is also a place where like you're hearing about some of these health issues that transition causes that get shut down in trans circles because you might scare someone and they might not transition if they knew that if they knew the health effects. In, in our shocking research on phalloplasty, it says that 40 percent of the time they end up incontinent mm. because they can't because they lose control of the muscle mm -hmm. that we all release when it's time to pee. Yeah, they also uh, bleed. They have a lot of cramps. Um, they have to constantly go to the toilet and they're basically in pain for the rest of their life. And then if a, a man becomes uh, with woman parts, you know, a vaginoplasty, they have to use a dilator every single week for the rest of their life. And there was a case, if you know, Jazz Jennings, who has the reality TV show, you know, and her mom who has transitioned uh, since she was a kid and also encourages other parents to transition their kids. She was bragging about it, you know, joking about it. And you can see this, this young kid, you know, she's about 18, 19 now, Jazz 
Miles Jennings. <clears throat> she is really, really suffering with her mental health. You see it on the screen and it's heartbreaking. And the mum is bragging that, oh, don't worry, you can use a dilator. And that's the reality of what these uh, people that transition have to go through. They're never going to be able to have these parts functioning normally. They're always going to have complications. They're going to be in pain. And again, there's no treatment for that because these doctors don't want to help them. You know, once they've done the operation, you know, you're out the door. They don't want you on as a statistic, as a detransitioner. Um, also, one well, one thing that the phrasing, at least, that I liked is um, I, I have a friend who detransitioned, and he he's referred to essentially the entire thing, specifically the bottom surgeries, as a, a sexual lobotomy. Your function is gone. It is destroyed. Um, he, he's referred to the process of gender transition as a sexual lobotomy, and I think that is a a very a very good way to phrase it because of the fact that it is a physical intervention that is destroying a part of you for what is a mental health condition and for the young um, for for young boys who go on puberty blockers and then cross sex hormones we talked about the lack of growth but they also never will it achieve um, a climax so h- how do you get how do you get consent from a 10 year old how do you explain if you're going to go on these puberty blockers and 95 percent go on to cross-sex hormones so once you're on puberty blockers you're going on cross-sex hormones that you will never experience a sexual pleasure how do you explain to a 10 year old what that means to give something up that you have no idea what it there and this is i believe forever um, forever how do you explain that how do you define an orgasm um, I believe this was out of the UK, one of their conclusions, but there is no there is no age appropriate way to explain to a child what the complete loss of their sexual function as an adult is. There's no age appropriate way to explain it, whether that be, you know, the boys on puberty blockers who will never develop that way, whether it be putting young girls on testosterone to the point where they have atrophy so bad that it doesn't matter, they're not going to be able to do things anyway. So it's... It's terrifying, and there is no there is no age appropriate way to explain that to a child. And also, it's one of those things where like, why are we, you know, listening to a young child, young teenager, young child's judgment when that kid, when that that kid is saying they don't want to have kids? Of course, they don't want to have kids. They're a child themselves. They haven't gotten a chance to grow up and know what that means. And we are destroying not only their sexual function, but their fertility before they have even gotten a chance to mature and get to the point where they can have the long-term decision-making to decide if that is something they even want. Yeah, I mean, to me, it goes back down to the responsibility to parents. And these parents have issues. They, they, they sincerely have issues. They need to be diagnosed to see what they're going through. Now, some of them that are just worried and they're like, oh my God, what do I do? I don't want my kid to you know, kill themselves, suicide, totally get it. They have the fear, but there's a certain responsibility that lies on the kids. I I want to read this to you, okay? Here's Here's a list of states where transgender surgery on minors is banned. We have 50 states in U.S. Only 18 states ban it. That means 32 states don't ban it. These are the states that ban it. Alabama, Arkansas, Arizona, Florida, Georgia, Idaho, Indiana, Iowa, Kentucky, Mississippi, Missouri, Uh, Montana, Nebraska, South Dakota, Oklahoma, South Dakota, Tennessee, Utah, okay? States where transgender surgery is approved with parental uh, approval. New York, California, Massachusetts, Alaska, Illinois, Minnesota, New Mexico, and California have made strides in protecting access to care for transgender people. States where transgender surgery is approved without parental approval. Let me read this to you, folks. States where transgender surgery is approved without parental approval, okay? Oregon allows minors as young as 15 years old to have sex reassignment surgery without consent from their parents. California allows children as long as young as 12 years old to receive taxpayer funded transgender treatment and services. Is this serious without parental consent, California? Following states is a list of states that have a state law that bans transgender students from participating in sports consistent with their transgender identity. Bama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Idaho, Iowa, Mississippi, Montana, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas, West Virginia. You, you keep going through these, and you're sitting there wondering, here are some places where schools can refer to students by their preferred gender without notifying parents. California, Chicago Public Schools, LAUSD, D.C. Public Schools, Baltimore City Public Schools, San Francisco Unified School District, Portland Public Schools, Seattle Public Schools. In Virginia, Fairfax uh, County Public Schools, Montgomery uh, County Public Schools, this is in Maryland, 
you you read this stuff. Are these people losing their minds? Completely. And I and I need I need to to comment on this because I'm going to comment it in pieces here. Let's be clear. Almost every public school in the United States is hiding social transition from the parents. Even in the state of Florida, they're still doing it. They are doing it in all the red states, too. They're doing it in the blue states. They are taught, they are trained that parents uh, don't need to know if their child is gender questioning. This is across the board. You can go onto their websites. You can see that they're claiming that children have, um, have privacy rights, which they don't have. In the state of California, 12-year-olds can transition um, on the state dime as long as they run away. As long as they're in foster care, then a, then a 12-year-old has power. So this is why this is the whole tie-in to that law that I talked about, why the government wants kids to be running away, because as soon as that child is 12, they have self-determination. Um, and same thing in, in uh, Oregon, and a lawsuit's being filed against the Oregon law for 15-year-olds. What you talked about is so important why California needs to end it in California, because all those red states, those 18 states with bans, all of those children can run away to the state of California and get and become a foster care kid oh. and get these gender interventions. And these trans wow. activists, it, it's insane. Well, you, you, you just said, let me interrupt and just ask one question. You just said California can be the sanctuary city for for trans runaways nationwide. It is. That law passed last year. We are a sanctuary state. So is Minnesota. Yep. So if a child from Florida gets a ticket and runs away to California, we take them in. We don't return them back to, to Florida. We take them in and we go ahead and throw them into our foster care system and let that child um, transition. That's why the ballot initiative in California to stop this is so important. It's not just a California ballot initiative. Yes, only Californians can vote on it, but everyone in the nation should be um, should be donating to this movement because, again, we'll take your kids, Kentucky. We'll take your kids from Tennessee, and we will harm them in our state in California. That's what we're doing. And not only that, we're going to advertise. Gavin Newsom passed a bill that is going to advertise in all those red states to come to California. If you're a child who wants to get transitioned, you come to our state. We'll take you in and we'll mutilate you. Um, you will. You will. Minnesota is also Minnesota is also a sanctuary state, but you already hear it in these in these states where where you have the laws passed protecting children, you already hear it from these activist parents. Well, we're going to move to Minnesota. We're going to move to California as if as if the states that are banning this would, would miss them. But um, they, they won't actively move. When you believe in something so um, as hard as these people do, you will actually, they will absolutely move just to be able to do this to their child or the child will run away. And you spoke about, you mentioned Oregon in that list of states. I believe it was Oregon or Washington that they... They made it where the state the state money will cover transition, but they actively excluded any coverage for detransitioners in their law. Wow! Like it's a, act, it's, like act, you actively. Know, it, it, it's just a one way street, isn't it? But but you know what it is. You know, sometimes people ask me and they'll say, "So why did you have that person on a podcast? Why did you have this person on a podcast? Why did you have that person on a podcast? And why did you let them talk?" Because the more they talk. If their argument is pathetic and insane, and you can't see the the hypocrisy in their argument, then it's you. You're responsible as well to understand that somebody's got gamesmanship on you. But the more they're doing things like this, they're just they're allowing others to make the argument why they're pathetic, why why they're doing what they're doing. By the way, there was a documentary that was supposed to come out. I want to finish on this year, AMC Post documentary featuring detransitioners from theaters. Uh, uh, in face of pressure, right? This was, I think, a few months ago, mm -hmm. June 19th or something like that. And uh, uh, TikTok played a pivotal role in Ash Eskridge's journey, as she explained. Uh, uh, no, not that one. This is the other one. AMC uh, uh, canceled screenings of the documentary No Way Back. Yes. The I, reality yes. of gender-affirming care after pressure from activists, including the Queer Trans Project, 
The transitional Laura Becker criticized the decision, saying, I think it's incredibly dangerous to set the precedent of suppressing free speech, suppressing viewpoints that basically are just unpopular or difficult to deal with. The 90-minute film features detransitioner stories and insights from experts examining the risks and long-term implications of gender-affirming medication. AMC attributed the cancellation to poor ticket sales. But Deplorable Films, the distribution company, defended the documentary, noting that those opposing it had not seen the film before taking actions to silence it. So actually about this about this film, um, I did a panel at a screening of it in L.A., but I also went to a film festival in Iowa to represent the director um, and talk about it and answer questions. And Laura, the quote from Laura that you just read out is completely right, that it is alarming that we are, you know, silencing essentially what is an unpopular opinion. The film is. I'm going to be real when you watch it. It's, it, it's like it's one of those things where you watch it and you're like this, this is what people are upset about because it's just presenting the other side of just how bad things have gotten. And it's presenting detransitioners stories and it, it has professionals in it. it has doctors in it. It has, you know, it has the people that are doing the quote unquote science that these people claim to care so much about. Um, it has them and it has them pointing out some truths that yes, they are uncomfortable, but they need to be said because kids are being hurt. And it was one of those things where, you know, um, they they canceled it and they can say it's because of poor ticket sales. It's not true. It's not true. I know the director. I know who wrote it. I know her, her whole story. um, And she's a Democrat too. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, yeah, they're canceling us left and right. Uh, This is, this is the way it is. Um, There's, a multitude of films have been been out there, but this one was was finally getting distribution, and the trans activists shut it down. Remember, sixty minutes about two years ago or three years ago, where the detransitioners went on, um, they cut that that programming too. They don't want to hear the other side. This is the cult mentality. The New York Times won't print my name. They've interviewed me countless times. They won't. They won't print the other side. They won't print the truth. Can't have somebody Google you. They might find out. Right. I, I mean, it is, it, it's hiding the best kept secret, right? If, if they are so proud of what they're doing, why, why are they afraid of listening to the other mm. side? I mean, you, you see the, the Washington Post, uh, they, they won't use the word detransitioner. They won't, they won't write about us. They won't write about the parents who are pulling their kids out. They won't write about the parents who are losing custody of their kids because they won't call their daughter a boy or their son a girl. There's complete silence on this. So I appreciate you having this podcast, but there are thousands of us, tens of thousands of us out there, and they're ignoring us and pretending it's not happening. Well, I, I, think, I think the most important thing when, when you said you know, what do they do when you're looking at this? Uh, what was the website? Reddit, you said, where yeah, everybody's Reddit. writing stuff and, and, and what's missing. To me, uh, uh, there's a few things in a situation like that. One, you need love and support, like a community you're part of where at least you feel like, man, there's other people that are going through what I'm going through. Two, you need faith because there's no one can do anything, man. The only thing you can rely on is some, a higher power to have faith in that's going to allow you to go through that process. Three, you need fighters that are going to fight for you, like yourself, that are doing what they're doing, and smart folks that are coming around that are willing to write bills. The average person is like, write a bill? How do I write a bill? Well, this is why you need folks like you that are willing to do that and, and stand up. You know. And, and then last but not least, you know, everybody lives a weird life, man. If you believe in God, God you know, sometimes chooses you to play a role of a, you know, a, a person that's going to share their message and inspire others that they're going through tough times and show strength. And sometimes, you know, life is a very weird life. We, we get taken advantage of at times. And those who can stand up and stay strong in that uh, end up inspiring others to also go through the challenge in times because they say, if he can do it, if she can do it, I can as well. I applaud you, Luca, for coming here and sharing your story. I applaud you a lot. Uh, really, and the reason why I say that, not that it's a competition, like I applaud you more than others. You're 21. You know, it's like for some of us, I mean, I heard you even say, I think you're right. a child to you're 25 years old because you're still developing. You're still at that 21 age, so, right? Some, that of the, some of the more prominent detransitioners, they transitioned as adults when they were going through it, you know, whether that be abuse, Chris trauma, Beck, all this stuff. Navy SEAL, that, you know, that's he, another he's, story. He's reached out to me. Yeah. Um, we were going to have him on today as well, and, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. So here's, here's what I want to know. We're at the end of the podcast. A uh, couple things. If you have any questions for Ali, 
uh, or Aaron. You can find them on Minek. Ask questions. Parents, ask as many questions as possible, specifically from Aaron, because she's in this. She can give you her perspective. Ali, for someone that's going through it. You can also visit the website uh, from Aaron's side on per- Protect Kids California, CA, protectkidsca.com. Ollie has a book that came out, Gender Madness. The link will, link will also be below for you to order it. And uh, aside from that, my biggest recommendation to everybody, share this content. Talk about it with your kids. Talk about it with your spouse. Talk about it with your siblings. Talk about it with your family, environment. Uh, get more of these types of conversations going. And if you're running another big podcast and you got kids, you're worried about it, why don't you invite them as well? to come and start talking about these things until mainstream has no choice but to have to talk about about it. We're seeing right now podcasters are starting to have more power than mainstream anyways. You know, the days of mainstreamers having that monopoly are behind us. There's many ways to get the message out. Once again, thank you so much for coming out and sharing your story with everybody. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye, bye-bye.